Uh, the Coal Lakes Research Farm is owned by farmers, and that's incredibly important because one of the things we have a lot of times with research is uh, I like to, to talk about it's, it's like a, that's a nice dog, but does it hunt? And so there's a lot of nice things we find in a research setting or people find in a research setting that don't scale up, and that's one of the things we do. We have both irrigation and dry land. You can't grow wet, uh, crops west of... The 100th meridian, we're west of the 100th meridian. So 100% uh, low disturbance no-till and the production enterprise is very important. The production enterprise funds most of our research now because of the universities are so narrow focused on short-term stuff. Uh, <clears throat> that's where we're located. I luckily drove in here yesterday. It's about a six hour drive. I could take the Missouri River, but it takes a bit longer. <laughs> So this is our headquarters building. That's what it kind of looks like. It's a mix of short grass prairie um, in places and some places that where we get a bit more water. It's tall grass prairie down in these major drainage ways. It's the only place we have trees. I made, made the mistake the first time I went to Australia. Somebody said, where are all your trees? And I said, Paul Bunyan cut them down. And then about 20 minutes later, I realized they had no idea who Paul Bunyan was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to backtrack and explain it. Uh, a farmer manages ecosystems. He's not a corn grower, he's not a soybean grower, he's not a wheat grower, he manages ecosystems. Uh, he takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and makes them into products to be sold. It's as, that simple. And how efficiently he does that is really... And, and, and then I, I like to break it down into looking at water cycles, energy flows, mineral cycles, and then community dynamics. So the water cycle, does, does the rain that falls to feed plants and recharge groundwater and do all those good things, or does it run off and cause erosion and water quality degradation? You know, how do you use your water? Coal Lakes Research Farm actually began because in the 70s, we had a bunch of farmers put in irrigators, pumped water 300 foot up the hill, threw it on the land, and it ran right back to the river, okay? And <clears throat> that gave us issues. And so we had them pumping the water up and running back into the Missouri River right here. We had to stop that, and we actually started with lots of rippers and all those kind of things. And in the 70s, we put in a no-till as a high runoff check. If you would read all the ag engineering literature in the 70s, no-till gave you the most runoff. And we had a heck of a time once we found out that no-till actually made the water go in the ground better, uh, getting that published. We now put on two inches of water in nine minutes on our irrigators. I had somebody last night walk, come up to me and had been there and that's what we do in the summer when people come we'll actually run the irrigators and and walk them right behind that irrigator and they won't get their feet muddy. So <clears throat> that's really what it's all about making the water go in the ground and then I like to say take the E out of ET and Jeff Mitchell's here from California. They've got this big problem and a guy was with the drought, and a guy was on TV the other day and said, well, we're giving up 30% of our water for a fish. Well, we're using half the water we used to use. So there's plenty of water if they'd use it efficiently for the fish and for the irrigators. But maintaining that surface residue is the real key. Energy flow, how much sunlight strikes green leaves, makes food for the ecosystem, makes nitrogen, whatever, and, and Chris Nichols right before lunch said, if you don't capture that energy, then you have to replace it with energy from someplace else, which is fossil fuels. If you put on a 150 pounds of N, in terms of fertilizer, that's 30 gallons of diesel fuel per acre. Just think of the energy cost in that. Now we have a, Dakota Lakes, we have a, uh, a goal of being energy neutral, fossil fuel neutral by 2026. And that means we're going to have to take all the nitrogen fertilizer out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we use forage and cover crops and we have for years. I mean, the, the original title here, I think Dale was, how do we integrate no-till into cover crops or something like that? And those all go together. That whole thing, we've always done all these. And we like to call them forage crops as well because the most efficient biomass digester has four legs and goes moo. Uh, 
So we use them to fine tune crop rotations, increase this carbon capture, sequester nutrients, fix nitrogen, encourage our friendlies. We haven't used an, uh, uh, an insecticide on the main station for 12 years. And we do corn on corn on one field yet. So that's kind of an interesting story. Uh, here's a, a photo of just one of our sequences. We would have, after wheat harvest and one of our irrigated rotations, we have wheat going to corn, and we will plant this mixture. Uh, this would be the, this was 2006, so we've done, I got witness that we've done it for a long time, and I wasn't as fat then as I am now. Uh, <clears throat> but early on, you've got the cowpeas coming. We have a mixture there of cowpeas and brassicas and whatever the cowpeas are coming on prevents us from having to spray herbicides on those, on that wheat stubble. There it is late in the fall with a couple things, some brassicas that flower, so it's, it's encouraging our friendlies to come and the pollinators and those kind of things. But the cowpeas have dived and gone back to Texas a long time ago. As soon as it gets to be about um, 36 degrees, they die, and then the next thing comes on. So it's kind of a, just like the prairie does, it sequences. And then there's me seeding the next year. Um, my seeder runs a little more level now, <laughs> in case you're. Now, this was an old photo, so we didn't have our auto steer on because I ought to steer better than this. Uh, so that's the old days, but we're not ripping her up real good. We're just kind of, but what we've done is we've mellowed out this, this high carbon thing and we've added nitrogen to it so now it's becoming organic matter. There's a corn coming up, there's a corn a couple weeks later, and there's a corn at harvest. And that whole sequence of events, we've had one herbicide application and no insecticide applications. So it's using biological things. Uh, <clears throat> mineral cycles, are the nutrients available for plant use or environmental services or have they been leached, eroded, transported from the landscape to the Gulf of Mexico or the Chesapeake Bay or Lake Michigan or Lake Winnipeg. You know, these are big issues. Ecosystems that leak nutrients for long enough periods of time become deserts. And what we're doing is trying to turn the, this great American uh, soil resource we have, we're trying to turn it into a desert. And we will succeed in time. Uh, saline seeps indicate leakage. Decreasing pH, pHs indicate leakage. Uh, one unit train of soybean contains one million pounds of phosphorus. Uh, if you read the, uh, the sidebars that I get to write, thanks to Howard, uh, <clears throat> to these articles that we're doing with the Cronin Farms and Farm Journal and, and whatever, if you read those, that was one of the things I included in that sidebar at one time. And <clears throat> so leakage occurs whether or not you know, when once we sell something, then we have to bring back fertilizer in, in a lot of cases. But that's just balancing the system. In the prairie, nothing ever left. So there's your saline seep. It's because we let too much water here without using it to do something beneficial become a problem here. It's really... So this is <coughs> uh, some photos from this year on the Cronin Farms, who's our little poster children, <laughs> our test thing. but. What we had them do is they do livestock, and we, we think that that's one of the key is putting the animals back because that was part of the prairie as well. So they, they had done oats and, and peas for a forage and baled it and hauled it to the edge of the field, and they did this uh, forage mix here with uh, pearl millet and German millet and a bunch of different millets. Uh, they swathed it, and then they seeded uh, winter triticale between the swaths and then they move the bales back out into the field and use them to hold the fence for the uh, swath grazing of the swaths and then here you see the cows um, this was just a few weeks ago they've been wintering those cows all winter now they've got the nutrients spread back out it's a nice uniform thing uh, my, my Argentine friends, when they come and watch all the balers people use in the United States, they go, so, Duane, the cows in Dakotas have no legs. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm proving to them that we have legs on our cows. Uh, but most importantly, most nitrogen 
in feed that's hauled to the feedlot does not make it back to the field. Most of the feed consumed in the field remains there, as well as the phosphorus and all the microorganisms that go with it, because the, the microorganisms of rumen are very closely tied to, in terms of species and whatever, to microorganisms that live in the soil. And Charles Darwin actually called the soil the rumen of the earth, if you go back far enough. You know, one of the interesting things with livestock in, in this cover crop thing, my grandfather planted sweet clover with his oats. And then when he took his horse binder and went and was binding the oats, he would throw rapeseed, dwarf Essex rapeseed, out from the, from the platform of the binder. And then when they got the oats shocked into these these shocks, they would turn the sheep out because the sheep would leave the dry oats alone and eat the green stuff. And then once they got the threshing done, they could turn out the cows. So if we think we're inventing something new, we're really not. And everything I've done with rotations and whatever, and I gave in my Hall of Fame speech, I said everything I've done to get here, I learned from my father and grandfather, going back and learning some of those techniques. Community dynamics do many species, great and small have fairly stable populations of all ages or the population of just a few species fluctuate widely. If you do tillage, you kill them all. And you've taken away all the cover. We have a big issue in South Dakota the last few years that the pheasants aren't there anymore in the east. Well, they took all the residue off in the east where they do the corn beans and now they're starting to bale the bean straw and the corn stalks and haul them away. Well, where are they going to live? You know, they're not there. Weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks it, so we just counteract that by adding beneficial diversity of our own. Uh, so there's a typical cover crop mix of ours. Cover and forage crops are a tool. They're not an end. You can't cut, just plant a cover and forage crop and say, okay, I did that. <laughs> it's like no-till. You can't just go out and say, well, I didn't do tillage this year. Plant something and go, I'm done. It takes a lot of planning and how do you fix it all together. Uh, <clears throat> they're a tool that we use to improve our rotation, diversity, and intensity while providing competition. Cover and forage crops give me an opportunity to increase both intensity and diversity in a situation where production of a grain crop would not be possible. If you don't have enough moisture, enough time, or it would be unprofitable to try to do that. A lot of people try to double crop in Kansas, for instance, just don't have enough moisture to pull it off, but they can do a single crop plus a cover crop or a forage crop and really get some benefit out of doing that. <clears throat> uh, or it would be too risky. In human environments, tall grass, prairie, or, or more, and we like to talk ecosystems, not rainfall, the goal should be to have something growing at all times. In areas with limited growing season, this, this requires use of cover crops because you just don't have, have the time. In subhuman, semi-arid like we are, in arid environments, cover crops can be utilized to increase organic matter and biological activity. So they have a benefit. And if you can graze them and utilize them that way, that's even a greater benefit. So here are the top 10 things I stole from <coughs> David Letterman. I do a lot of top 10s, uh, but mine aren't as funny as his are. Uh, decide what you want to do before trying and choosing your cover crop. What, what happens a lot of times, somebody says, oh, I'm going to go do cover crops and just go out and grab a mix and throw them in and they have no idea what they're trying to do. Our cover crops will often be mixtures, but they're, they're mixtures that maybe are all grasses or they're all, they're all broad leaves plus some cool season grasses going to corn. They're not going to have warm season grasses going to a warm season grass. You're, you're trying to nudge that, that ecosystem a bit to favor your next crop. Uh, think of this cover crop as another component in your rotation. Just treat it just that way. Uh, using mixture cover crops allows meeting several goals simultaneously. Uh, mixtures add more diversity than you get with a single one. They grow at different times, which is one of the tricks we like to use. They better compete with weeds, again, because they grow at these different times. And they optimize this nutrient cycling thing. And <clears throat> here's an example of that. There's a field of corn that was planted with no nitrogen and no companion crop. You can see it's not only droughty, but it's very nitrogen deficient. And if we put soybeans, forage soybeans between the rows, and this is about 10 feet away from here, you can see this guy is feeding nitrogen to this guy. And they're also, uh, because of the mycorrhizae 
going on there. They also have better water efficiency. It's really kind of an interesting thing. This is one that we're doing on one of our long-term no-till fields, uh, irrigated continuous corn. Uh, we have uh, alfalfa as a companion crop. That we've, we're in the third year of this. We're just trying to keep the alfalfa alive to feed the nitrogen to the corn and give us a place for our friendlies to live. And so we suppress the alfalfa. We don't try to harvest the alfalfa. We just suppress the alfalfa and then grow the corn. And uh, bromoxanil will back it off, buckteril will back it off, and that's all we do is just back it off. And actually with planting date, we're starting to find if we wait a little longer, the alfalfa kind of starts to mature, and then you plant the corn, and it doesn't take much to suppress the alfalfa. It surprises me too, Howard. It's one of those things you go... I don't mean to interrupt, but we're, we're getting ready to kill a whole kit of alfalfa <laughs> so we can plant corn. Right. You probably should do that because you have some autotoxicity from that alfalfa in time, but... Okay, so that's not so bad. Right. Okay, I just saw this and I'm thinking, well, maybe I need some of that. But we start fresh with... It's fresh. It's in there. Yeah, and it's Roundup Ready alfalfa, which allows you to do some weed control in the corn. So why are you saying I should go ahead and kill the alfalfa? Because you've got an alfalfa, the field is worn out already. Yeah. Terra lasts and lasts, so you don't kill it off. And you can, you can, you can suppress it with glyphosate, it doesn't kill it. But not with that. Yeah, and this is one that surprised me for us. Is I think there's a lot of things. Creating conditions beneficial, the next crop is your primary goal most of the time. Water and nutrient management is another primary goal. And when I work with groups in South Dakota, we look at this, this web soil survey thing to figure out how to to do that on each individual soil, but the cover needs to be maintained. A lot of times you'll get too crazy on the brassicas and all your residue goes away and it costs us 20 bushel of corn. It can happen really fast. Uh, <clears throat> this is a graduate student of mine. We did a whole bunch of mixes and I'm not gonna show you all that, but in, in, in the 100th meridian, stored moisture is really important. So after weed harvest going to corn, they really, on dry land, they don't, this is dry land research, uh, here's the soil water recharge over the winter, just brought it right back up because we have one of the things we put in most of our mixes is flax, so we'll get a lot of snow catch. Understanding rainfall patterns, this is where the web soil surveying stuff comes in. Uh, and I've got a good, web, I got a good uh, spreadsheet that if you want to get it, just email me and we'll, we'll send it to you. Cover crop seeds must be inexpensive, I used to say cheap. My wife said, don't be cheap, be inexpensive or prudent, so I'm inexpensive. In terms of potential benefit, um, small seeds mean less volume per acre and, and require less tank fills. Small seeds grow better on the surface. Large seeds usually emerge better through a matter residue. I talked to Joe, um, uh, oh, Don, from Don Manufacturing, Joe ba uh, Bassett. And he would say, oh, we need better equipment, whatever. And said, what we need is a machine that will make clay seed balls. And I said, you make me a machine that will make clay seed balls that have a little coat on the outside that lets us meter them and, and spread them out there and whatever. And, and then I said, you can work with the Burns Brothers and all these other guys, and they can put in their clay seed ball machine. And that's, that makes this all a lot easier. You don't need something to go ripping around the soil. You just need something to make clay seed balls. Uh, using harrows to improve the stand of surface broadcast seed improves the stand of weeds. So uh, <clears throat> one important goal is to use the cover crop to balance the diet of the soil organisms. High carbon residue uh, like wheat straw or corn stalks requires low carbon um, cover crops to balance the diet. Low residue cover crops require high residue cover crops. When, when DuPont Pioneers says if you take off corn for ethanol, you'll need less nitrogen the next year, that's exactly what's happening. You have less carbon out there. You've taken the carbon. What it means is you're making less organic matter. And I, I bristle whenever I have somebody bring that up. Managing cover crops is more guesswork than science at this point. The rotation sanitation competition are their primary tools of pest control of any kind. Uh, <clears throat> when we use livestock, we call this catch and release nutrients. Uh, <laughs> That's really what cover crops are. And I, I stole this from, from uh, Jeremy Wilson in 
in Jamestown, they used that in one of your articles too. It, you realize, Howard, I'm stealing all these things I'm putting in your, your, your article. <laughs> and, then, and then here's Danny Forge. The cows are waiting to see if he, when he soil tests, if they need to apply here or someplace else. <laughs> um, <laughs> so these are my three daughters who are the two oldest ones are now in college and the oldest one's about ready to graduate with environmental engineering degrees, which are soil scientists that make more money. But this is in the, U the Museum of Man and Nature. This is a root system of a native prairie plant. We're not even close, ladies and gentlemen, with what we've been doing with our root systems. That's what we've got to try to emulate. If we don't, we'll end up looking like Afghanistan. This is a friend of ours that was seeding. This was taken in the January after they started bombing in December in, in, um, in Afghanistan. But, <clears throat> you know, that Hindu Kush used to be all trees, and they needed just a little bit more fuel just a little more fuel and they kept taking that well it's gone and this is all they have left and that's why they have wars and poverty and we don't want to be there uh, what's missing residue he can no-till but he doesn't have residue doesn't make any difference and where'd the residue go well Abdul took it and he actually pulled it up by the roots now that may be what he's using to feed the goat that gives his daughter milk so I can't really fault him, but let's stop before we get to that point. And he loads it on his semis or his straight truck and hauls it to the building. Um, Argentina had this system with cattle, diverse rotations with pastures and perennials. I think we'll have to go back to using some perennials. And then <clears throat> they had soils like this. And when people talk soil health, I always like to say, well, define a beautiful woman or a handsome man. Write it down. You can't do it. Same way with soil health, but we all know one when, when we see one. Okay? Ten years later, once they banned the export of beef and the guys quit doing cattle and started doing all soybeans, or soybeans and corn, but mostly soybeans and soybeans, that very spot looks like this. It's absolutely criminal. Okay? Within all textural groups, organic matter increased from 1 to 3%. The available water capacity doubled get to 4%, <clears throat> it's 60% available water. 27,000 gallons of water per 1%. That means a quarter inch and six inches, you go to 4%. Uh, <clears throat> that is one inch in the top six inches or two inches of water in the top foot, okay? When soil water storage capacity is low, and that's what we have in the Corn Belt now, we've got it mined to the point much of the rain that falls during extended periods of precipitation is lost. In contrast, the high water storage capacity combined with effective capture of rain and snow melt over the fall, winter, and spring can support a crop during extended dry periods. Why are we all of a sudden too wet and then too dry and too wet and too dry in the Corn Belt? We've screwed up the soils. They don't hold the water they used to. <clears throat> Commonality bunch tillage tools. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. All tillage tools increase weeds. Somebody got up at a meeting and said, my tillage tool is better than this tillage tool. Uh-uh. There's no such thing. Okay. Continuous low disturbance, no-till in combination with diverse rotation and cover crops is a biological answer to a biological problem. Thank you. Thank you.